and welcome to this um, fish night, fish night eight. Um, my name is Tom Mitchell. I'm the executive director of IAED, started back in September, and I'll be your host and moderator today, um, and certainly ably supported by many other members of the team from IAED, who I'm sure will, will become familiar to you over the, the next hour and a quarter if you've not met them. Um, and so, as you will see today, the topic of our conversation is on keeping up momentum for artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. Um, following the, uh, the year, the IAFA year, we will come on to talk about. Um, and today, I'm delighted, really, to be hosting a, uh, a conversation, really, with um, two speakers that we'll come to and introduce very shortly. Um, and hopefully with an opportunity for all of you with questions or comments or ideas to also contribute over the next hour and a quarter. Um, and so uh, really looking forward to a lively discussion and hopefully um, uh, uh, something entertaining for us as well by keeping our comments brief, punchy, um, exciting as well, but I'm sure you'll help me with that. So um, just as a note about why we're getting into this topic and, and kind of how important it is, um, I'll shortly pass to Annabelle to talk a little bit about IAED's work and involvement in this area, but um, this topic couldn't really be more important at the moment. We know that small-scale fisheries and aquaculture are critically important for livelihoods and nutrition for hundreds of millions of family. In fact, 7% of the world's people at least partially dependent on small scale fisheries, whether for, for nutrition or for work. And we know also that living and working on coasts and flood, flood plains, that small scale fishers and fish workers tend to be extremely vulnerable to the impacts of climate change or, or biodiversity loss. Yeah, but we also know with the right support that they hold huge potential for transforming food systems to, to low emissions and to protect aquatic biodiversity. Um, and with all the threats around and the opportunities, we've really got to work out how we can uh, make the most of that opportunity. So I think in recognition of the contribution that um, small scale fisheries make to sustainable development, 2022 was designated by the UN as the International Year of Artisanal Fisheries and Aquaculture, so IAFA. And so the goal of that year was to really raise awareness of the contribution of small scale fisheries and to also strengthen the relationship between scientists and policymakers and actors on the ground to make sure that um, people on the front lines of the challenges are part of those decision making processes. And so during the year, there was a lot of work called to action, um, really focusing on 2030 to make sure small scale fisheries are protected and restored. And really the focus of this particular event is to look at how we can build on the momentum from that year and make sure that we can continue with concrete steps. And so I think what I'd like to make sure we do in the contributions and discussions that we have, that you do your best to help us think about what concrete steps that we could take to maintain together a support for the sector and the momentum that we've had from the year. And so before I get to the speakers, and as promised, um, I'd like to turn to my colleague, Annabelle Bladen, to talk about IAD's work on the inclusive blue economy. Annabelle, over to you. Thanks, Tom, and hi, everyone. Thank you for coming. Um, so as some of you will know, we've been holding these events since 2013 in an effort to bring together diverse groups of people to discuss issues around how humans interact with the ocean and particularly fisheries and aquaculture. The idea is to promote the sharing of knowledge and lessons to inspire change towards a more sustainable and equitable future. Now we used to hold fish night in person, but since the pandemic we've been online and while we miss the drinks and snacks afterwards, we do appreciate being able to include those of you joining us from afar. These events are part of our program on inclusive blue economy, work that aims to support sustainable and resilient aquatic ecosystems and the people who depend on them through collaborative research and meaningful dialogues. Our overarching goal is to identify and promote the development of innovative, cost-effective and evidence-based solutions for the conservation and sustainable use of aquatic resources. So supporting countries to meet SDG 14, life below water. 
We work at local, national and global levels, always trying to connect local priorities and local solutions to global challenges. And what this means is that our work typically focuses on people and communities involved in small scale fisheries and aquaculture, who are by far the largest group of people in the blue economy. We believe that by reorienting the blue economy agenda to prioritize social sustainability and equity and empowering small scale fishers and fish workers and local communities to lead change, this is how we can make the blue economy agenda a novel and meaningful way to drive progress, not only towards SDG 14, but towards all of the sustainable development goals. So that's why over the last few years, we've been working hard to increase the global visibility of small scale fisheries, joining several other organizations to support the FAO's leadership of IAFA. We produced a series of infographics to raise awareness on the importance of the small scale sector, its challenges and opportunities. We advocated at the UN Ocean Conference in Lisbon last year for the sector to be included in dialogues and decision making. And we recently published research on the seafood sourcing policies of big retailers in the UK and Europe, exploring the barriers to small scale fisheries entering international markets and what retailers can do to improve access while supporting sustainability. So with that, I hope you enjoyed today's conversation and I will pass back over to Tom. Thank you, Annabelle. Well, let me just take a moment to introduce you to our two main speakers today. Um, I'd like to introduce you to Edith Rudith Lukanga and Jeremy Percy. Um, in terms of their bios, let me just quickly summarize. These are always kind of funny points where you don't know how quite long, how long to go, but I would just note that both of them have huge amounts of experience and affiliations. Um, and so Edith Rudith is co-founder and executive director of the Environmental Management and Economic Development Organization, a nonprofit. Um, organization working on natural resource governance in Tanzania. She holds several positions in leadership of small scale fisher and fish worker organizations, including the World Forum and Fish Harvesters and Fish Workers, and the African Women Fish Processors and Traders Network, and is vice chair of the International Steering Committee of AFA, representing the International Planning Committee for Food Sovereignty Working Group on Fisheries. And Jeremy Percy has been a crew, skipper and owner of a variety of fishing vessels across UK and Irish waters. He is a master of fisheries protection vessel, as well as deputy director of a sea fisheries committee with responsibility for inshore fisheries management. Jeremy managed the first real time Internet based fresh fish auction in, the, in, in England and Wales and was owner and managing director of a successful fish processing and export company based in Milford Haven. Previously, Jeremy was CEO of the main Welsh Fishermen's Federation, CEO to the Low Impact Fishes of Europe platform, and currently CEO to the new Under 10 Fishermen's Association for England and Wales. So I'm sure you'll agree that there are two um, very accomplished, experienced speakers for us to hear from. Now, the way that this is gonna work is that I will pose an initial set of framing questions to Edit Rudith and to Jeremy. Um, we'll go through a few rapid responses from them and then we'll open up the floor to um, questions and discussions. So Edit Rudith, firstly to you, thank you very much for joining us. Um, you were on the International Steering Committee for IAFA. Can you give a brief overview of the year, why it came about and what do you think it's achieved? Thank you. Thank you so much for this question and also for the very good introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Good evening or good morning, depending on where you are at. Yeah, so to respond to this question, um, why it came about and uh, what it has achieved. Um, the reasons why the year came about uh, stems from 2014 when FAO members endorsed the voluntary guidelines for securing sustainable small-scale fisheries in the context of food security and poverty alleviation, which are shortly called as uh, SSF guidelines. So the guidelines are a result of a very long participatory process that was demanded primarily by the civil society organizations as a means to acknowledge the important role that uh, the sector small scale fisheries sector plays for sustainable development 
and to help addressing the challenges that it faces. So recognition of the small scale fisheries grew throughout the development process of the SSF guidelines. And uh, in 2016, the group of Latin American countries in, in, during the FAO's Committee on Fisheries proposed a dedicated international year of artisanal fisheries and aquaculture. So it was welcomed by the other members and this proposal later on was taken uh, away to the General Assembly, which declared the 2022 as the international year. So 2022, much as it was overshadowed by the COVID-19, um, which had an impact on both the possibilities to organize many in-person celebrations and also funding availability as no dedicated funding uh, could be established for the year because other issues by that time were rightly more uh, of a priority. So despite this, the small scale fishery stakeholders all around the world organized um, many events, including there were about 260 virtual, um, virtual uh, hybrid and in-person events. And this happened at the global level, regional, and even at the national level. And uh, there were also over 300 publications that came out. They were supported greatly by the communication products made available by FAO. And um, FAO has been the lead agency throughout this year. And all this contributed to the achieving the objectives of the year, which include to raise awareness on the significant role that the small scale fisheries sector in aquaculture plays, and also to strengthening the interaction uh, among stakeholders, but also empowering stakeholders uh, to take action, but also to build a new and strengthen existing partnerships. So this was uh, really a, 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 a reason as to why this year came about, continuing to amplify, appreciating, acknowledging this significant role that the small scale fisheries sector plays. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just as a reminder for everybody, we did ask if you could introduce yourself in the chat so we know who's around the table. Thank you very much to Rachel for doing that. Um, and for others coming in. So please do take the opportunity and we can see who's around the table. Is it Rudy, thank you for your introductions. Let me pass to Jeremy and Jeremy ask you, you know, you, um, you obviously have kept track of what's been happening during IAFA, but can you just talk from your perspective, why you think it's been so needed and equally why, why do we need to um, ensure that there is much more significant support for small-scale fisheries and aquaculture. You're on mute, Jeremy. Buttons, I'm in trouble. There you there are. There you go. Yeah. Try again. Good day, everybody, wherever you are. Um, hi, Tom, and thanks so much for the uh, invitation to join the uh, join the discussion today. Um, I mean, I suppose if I'm absolutely honest, the Yaffa to an extent passed us by in the northern, um, the global north. I think it was very much focused quite rightly on the global south. But uh, in terms of your question generally, I mean, it is absolutely vital that um, small scale fisheries gain more support and visibility. Um, it's it's, it's 70, in the UK, it's 79 percent of the fleet by number. I mean, we do get into definitions here, Tom, and you've got artisanal, you can argue that toss about what that means small scale low impact inshore offshore not sure it's it's there's a whole range of definitions but i think the best definition was was a friend of mine brian O'Reardon, who said that uh, what small scale is very difficult to define but you know it when you see it um and i think that's true true wherever you are i mean the, the visibility thing is is absolutely key um irrespective of where you are certainly in the north um Small scale fisheries are undervalued, um, under uh, underrated, uh, and under supported certainly by by policy. And visibility is the is the absolute key. I mean, one of the things I have learned, I think, over the years is that, irrespective of where you are um, in the world, to a very large extent, small scale fishers uh, have the same problems, and and to an extent, therefore, the same opportunities. Um, when I ran the Low Impact Fishers of Europe platform, um, we had fishermen from all the way, fishermen and fisher persons, 
<laughs> fishers across the whole of Europe. And it really didn't matter whether you were in Ireland, the UK, the Baltic, the Mediterranean. What was very clear is that the vast majority of problems were common to all of us, as were to an extent so the same, the same uh, opportunities. I think the key really is in terms of the need for visibility and support is to persuade policymakers that we are actually worth the trouble that they have to go to 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 provide that level of support. Um, it's it is frustrating, and anybody in this discussion who has a, a link to artisanal and small scale fisheries will share my frustrations that we are or should be viewed as part of the solution. And to an extent, we are still viewed in some areas as part of the problem. And I, I, if I'm honest again, I think to an extent it's our own fault. You know, um, whereas larger scale operators tend to be much better resourced, they consider themselves businesses rather than fishers. And I think that's a fundamental difference. And <laughs> I can't, I can't talk for Edit Ruth's people uh, and members, but certainly in the north, I mean, if you get two fishers in a room, you'll get three opinions. And trying to pull us all together to act as a coherent unit is, I think, a, an ongoing challenge. But unless we overcome that, um, then really, um, we're always going to struggle for that key element, which when you strip it all down, is all about political influence. That's it, start and finish, unless we can positively influence policy at a, a local, regional, national and international level, frankly, then we, we're really you know, struggling and we'll continue to do so. Thank you, Jeremy. Really good. Um, I'm going to ask the next question to both of you, which you've highlighted really the importance and the, the critical uh, aspects of maintaining visibility and so on. But but in practical terms, what, what should we be doing? What more should we be doing coming out of the international year? Um, maybe, Edit Rudith, I could turn to you first for that. Yeah, so what more should we be doing is a very good question because uh, we are not yet there. And for me, uh, this question, I would like to align it with the implementation of the Uh, in the context and poverty can you hear me we just you just paused for a moment but maybe you could just repeat your last sentence and then go from there okay so i was saying uh i would like to um to respond in line with the implementation of the ssf guidelines as to what should we be doing more um is to 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 uh, ask the actors mainly the states and other actors who are responsible for um, safeguarding the small-scale fisheries and aquaculture to ensuring that the small-scale fisheries guidelines are implemented. Because the SSF guidelines are the main opportunity uh, because they, they, they provide uh, this consolidated framework for action. Uh, and this is grounded in the needs of the communities and provide guidance on how to address you know, the challenges that they, the communities are facing. So the way they are situated in the framework of the food security and poverty alleviation, and this direct link to the SSF, I mean, to, to, to the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So I think if the SSF guidelines are implemented, they will also, um, facilitate the realization of the SDGs targets. And we have a, a, a number of SDGs that um, can tick that they've been implemented or they've been successful just by implementing the, the SSF guidelines. And these include, for example, the SDG one, no poverty, uh, SDG two, uh, zero hunger, health and well being, SDG three. Uh, the one for gender, because we are also now acknowledging the significant contribution uh, that is uh, by, by, by women in the sector, uh, but also uh, SDG number eight, you know, decent work, the fishers and fish worker, the way, uh, the, the environment that they are working in, to what extent is it decent enough? And when this, um, the SSF guidelines is implemented, 
it will be able to highlight and address the challenges, but also uh, the, the lies um, uh, 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 below water, SDG number 14. So what more should be done? I would really underline and even bold the implementation of the SSF guidelines. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Jeremy, what about from your perspective? It's a difficult one, Tom, to be honest. I mean, I think the, the SDGs, to an extent, um, have been focused, and absolutely rightly in many respects, on, on the global south. And really, the focus has been on there. If you look at the workshops that have been undertaken, they've all been in those, in those geographical areas. Um, my frustration has been that it's very often viewed, when we, and even in this conversation, when we're talking about small scale artisanal fishers, that people almost inevitably look at it from a global south perspective, uh, you know, with the problems, the challenges, the threats, etc. But having dealt with and represented small scale, low impact artisanal to an extent, fishers in the, in the global north and especially across Europe, over many years, we suffer the same issues, this lack of, lack of visibility. Um, and, and really, as I said previously, being viewed more as a problem than an opportunity. And uh, so I think the there is an opportunity. I, know, I don't quite know how we do it. The FAO have been active to an extent, I suppose, in, in pursuing uh, and, and advocating for, for SA, SDGs, etc. But it's, I think we struggle to be understood in certainly in Europe that um, the small scale fleet, and we tend to deal with small scale as a, as a definition or low impact as a definition rather than artisanal per se. But I think we struggle for visibility and being taken seriously to an extent um, by policymakers, which as I said previously really is, is the key. And I suppose our solution to an extent lays in our own hands. Uh, and I, I do come back to the same point, sorry, that I made previously, that you know, it is very difficult to bring together a vast number of disparate fishers um, across many geographical areas into a coherent whole. I think the low impact fishers of Europe, the life platform has achieved huge amounts in this, in this respect and trying to get people to work collectively. Um, and it comes down to resources and marketing and all the usual challenges. But I suppose really um, that the main opportunities are there uh, and to an extent they're in our own hands, if only in terms of being able to influence wider policy. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, so let me just, uh, I suppose, let come back to you first on one of the points you made, which is that the SDGs and kind of the, the framing of them for small scale, scale fisheries may be more appropriate to the global south. But, you know, you and I know that there have been significant challenges in the UK with access to markets, particularly related to Brexit and so on. And we've got SDG uh, 14B, which is focused on providing access of small scale fishes to resources and markets. And I just wondered in that respect, you know, what, what you felt was the, the kind of the barriers and options for removing those barriers to be able to support um, low impact fisheries? Good question, Tom. Um, and it's difficult to put these things into sort of short, short responses. I mean, I think in terms of the, there's a, the whole market thing is massive. Um, you know, we, we are currently, I am literally um, in the last few days and weeks, we've been talking to larger retailers, to um, the Soil Association, which in the UK is a very, very highly respected uh, accreditation um, body for agricultural, uh, horticultural sides, but not so much for fisheries, seeking to get their accreditation for small scale, low impact fishers. So market access, you can break down really. Uh, and again, it's, it's local, but in the UK, certainly we have to, cut out markets for ourselves the vast majority of consumers purchase fish through the larger retailers and we've lost any number of you know, local fishmongers which is where you normally sell higher quality day caught fish and we are in the transition here i think and have been for some years because these things don't happen overnight 
and the market side of things here is very diverse. Um, we've got organizations, we've got individual fishers that hawk their fish around the local area. Um, we've got companies like the Soul of Discretion um, based down in Plymouth um, and to, to some extent pesky fish that try and provide direct sales to consumers, online sales, and there's a number of issues and a number of routes for that. But it's still a struggle, really, um, which it shouldn't be because we produce probably the best possible quality fish that you can uh, you, you, you can provide. So the marketing thing is multifaceted and particularly challenging, um, and not least in a cost of fishing, a cost of living crisis. Um, I mean, it is an anomaly, certainly in the UK, that people consumers only tend to buy decent quality fish, uh, fresh fish, when they go to food um, sales places, restaurants, etc. Um, they don't tend um, to take it home and cook it. Um, food service outlets take up a significant proportion of, of marketing. Um, uh, whereas, um, perversely, when our people go on holiday to Europe, they very happily come back and say, they're this wonderful fresh fish and shellfish, most of which probably came from UK waters strangely so you know we, we still have this sort of ongoing um market penetration challenges but we're getting there i think to an extent in terms of the resources that's a whole access to resources is a whole different story and again it could be a very long answer but i promise you it won't be um we had article 17 when we were in in europe i mean brexit's throwing a hand grenade into fish sales into europe we used to export 80 percent um of what we landed here and we still export a very significant amount but the, uh, the the difficulties and the costs involved have skyrocketed post brexit but don't start me on brexit i will take this opportunity to apologize to the rest of the world for brexit um some of us even fishermen didn't vote for it um so when we were in the common fishery policy which i didn't have a lot of faith in to be honest we had article 17 um, which said that member states shall not might or if they feel like it they shall include social uh, economic and environmental criteria when providing access to fishing opportunities, which mainly is, is, is quota in the northern uh, context. Um, and that was introduced in 2013 and has never been utilized really, um, uh, which is an immense frustration because if you speak to, you know, I speak to schools and you speak to children and you say, well, the, the way that we give access to fishermen is not based on their social or their economic or their environmental benefits and attributes. It's basically who has the deepest pockets um, or who was given the right to access to fishing opportunities, to quota and to fish catches by some sort of outdated system that was basically built, certainly in the UK, on a pack of lies. Um, and it, it is this anomaly, which I think is probably the most significant frustration in terms of access to resources. In We've now got post-Brexit in the UK, we've now got the shiny new Fisheries Act 2020, and that Article 25 of that really mirrors Article 17 um, of the common fishery policy in terms of saying that the, the government must include social and economic criteria when allocating access to fishing opportunities. And that's only been really in for this year. And we're already having arguments about with the government about definitions and what it means and what it doesn't mean. Um, basically, they're very keen on maintaining the status quo because in the UK, we are seven small scale under 10 meters. Sorry, I should explain for those who don't know. We have small scale 10 meters and under in length and we have large scale over 10 meters. And the under 10 meters are 79% of the fleet by number. So four out of every five boats is under 10 meters in length. Yet we have access to only just over 2% of the quota. And we've been fighting that unfairness for, for years. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, really, really good kind of reflections and challenges. And just wanting to note in the chat, thank you, everybody, for putting in your your details and affiliations. Isn't it wonderful to see people from all from from north northern Colombia on one side to the Philippines on the other, and to to the Finland in the north to Zimbabwe in the south, and so on. It's um, really great to see such a diversity of people coming in to be part of this conversation. And I think reinforces the fact that there are small scale, low impact artisanal fisheries everywhere on the planet.
of which all have their challenges in different ways, but really fabulous to see everybody. Thank you for joining. Edit Rudith, let me toin, uh, toin? Let me turn to you. Um, I'd be really interested to get your perspectives on, you know, you're obviously working in Tanzania on the shores of Lake Victoria as well. Um, what do you see from the perspective of access to markets or, or are resources getting to where they need to get to to support those communities? Yeah, th yeah. thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Um, uh, SDG 14B and looking at this target, uh, it is an immense recognition of the small scale fisheries and it speaks to two fundamental aspects that ensure that people can derive a decent livelihood from the subsector. Um, access to um, marine, but also to inland resources is the fundamental condition to allow for such livelihoods, be it for subsistence or for marketing. And it is therefore, uh, fundamental to ensure that rights to resources for small scale fisheries are secured, including what is refer, uh, referred to as the, the informal or customary rights. And such rights obviously uh, also come with the responsibilities, for example, to manage uh, these resources sustainably as called for also even in the, in the SSF guidelines, because it calls for responsibility. And Recently, we had this uh, IHH study that was launched. And in that, we learned that it is generally accepted that long-term sustainability will not be secured under open access regimes. And hence, small-scale fishers and fishing communities uh, require secure access to resources. However, present access to many small-scale fisheries remains unregulated. Uh, tenure rights, sometimes referred to as uh, property rights, limit access by authorizing who can use the resources and the conditions under which those resources can be, uh, can be used. And they can also include rights concerning the management of resources, typically through uh, some form of the co-management with the government, as well as the rights of exclusion and um, transferability. So tenure rights, I would say they are, they are really the heart of the governance of the small scale fisheries. So there have been both successes and failures with different um, systems of rights and uh, the details of the approaches that need to be tailored to each fisheries context. Still, the available evidence indicates that sustainable systems of tenure rights that provides users with adequate control in decision making through devolution and decentralization of authority and management, as well as the enforcement of regulations, also provide the incentives to strive for responsible management and sustainable use of the resources. So in relation to, to, to the markets, it is equally important that small scale fisheries have access to local, regional, um, uh, and even international markets. And this often require action such as capacity development for improved handling, better organization uh, of uh, producers to, to, to be able to address power imbalances, but also access to price, access to market information, access to technology. So it calls for a lot of actions that if they are done properly, and if these actors are empowered, then this could, could, could happen. So SDG 14B, which is in line with chapters five and seven of the SSF guidelines, help in holding all the duty bearers accountable and to take action in this regard. So what we need here, be it a access to market, access to resources, we need actions to be oriented to these actors. They should be empowered. They should be um, supported in order to have um, a supportive environment for them to, to, to thrive for them to be able to access both the resources and the market. 
Thank you. Really, really fascinating stuff. And it, it helps to outline the kind of complexities of providing the support and resources or, or getting that right. I just wondered if I could follow up with you and just ask about the kind of gendered dimensions here. What do you see in terms of the equity or lack of equity in terms of access to resources or markets? Yeah, so uh, again, this one calls for um, what we are seeing every other day, the, the significant contribution that women have in the small scale fisheries sector. And if you look at the post harvest section of the sector, more than 50% is women. But then um, they are working in various challenges. They are faced with various challenges including to what I've already mentioned. So in terms of proportionality, women really suffer the most. And that's why um, different actors and um, some of us, including myself, we are working together to support the women so that they are able to, 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 to access, you know, uh, uh, to, to, we want to really see that we, we cross that boundary of equity and um, accessibility. So women are more disadvantaged, I would say, when it comes to access to information, uh, access to resources, access to technology, and therefore gender equity is, is significant uh, um, phenomenon to be included in, in, in a way that it will bring the women, it will help to address all the barriers that women are facing so that they could also be pulled up to be aligned together with men, but also to have their contribution really be felt, be acknowledged and be uh, appreciated. Thank you very much. Brilliant. Um, we, so we're coming to the kind of close of the Q&A with me, but that means it's the opportunity for you um, all in the audience here to come forward with your questions. Please do pose your questions in the chat here um, or your perspectives that you want to come in and voice. So uh, please do just type them in the chat as you've typed your introduction and we'll shortly be coming to you and, and we'll pick out some questions and hopefully generate a bit more of a discussion. But before we do that, I just want to touch on um, the threats posed and the opportunities created by climate change. And I was um, telling the team this week that my first experience of working with small scale fisheries was in the Philippines, um, where we were doing work on the impacts of climate change and on adaptation to climate change. And my experience was that uh, the, the small scale fishing communities there were needing to travel further in order to be able to access um, the catch uh, that was related to coral bleaching issues, um, related to to um, typhoons, the warming of the seas, and so on. We know this this story quite well. The impact, the most direct impact it was having, and we were working on child centred climate change adaptation issues, was on children being pulled out of school in order to access, in order to provide care within the family home. And so I remember very clearly the work that we did with. Um, several uh, teenage girls who were not going to school as a result of the fact that their families were needing to travel further in order to be able to access the shoals and that that was causing significant difficulties in, in, in balancing care in the home. Now, what resulted out of my experience then is that one of those teenage girls was the first ever youth uh, child representative to go to a climate change COP and talk about her experiences. And she shared that experience with a public transport campaigner from the north of England and many other children as well. But they shared a real sense of solidarity on the fact that campaigning for low carbon public transport in the north of England was directly related to her chances of being able to go to school um, and to work with the small scale communities in the Philippines. And it was for me a wonderful kind of moment of recognition and solidarity of young people across the planet towards a common goal. Um, and thankfully, the work on, on kind of children's voice and youth voice in the climate negotiations has really been amplified recently, but that was one of the first um, instances back in 2007. And so I think the question that I'm coming to as a result is that, 
you know, from your perspective, Jeremy and Edith Rudith, what do you see as the fundamental threats posed by climate change to small scale fisheries, but also what potentially are some of the opportunities? And I know that overlays quite a lot of the challenges that you've been you've been uh, highlighting here, but maybe Edith Rudith, I could start with you. Yeah, thank you. If I can um, come in first. Yeah, um, one of the major challenges is how to make the fisheries and aquaculture more visible in the international and more importantly, uh, uh, in the national policies and plans that are um, related to climate change, biodiversity and nutrition. And I think we need transformational initiatives that can link climate change, small scale fisheries livelihoods, biodiversity, conservation and nutritional needs. So what needs to be done is to align narratives and avoid fragmenting messages. Um, reciprocal mainstreaming is a recommended approach, for example, that mainstream fisheries in climate biodiversity and nutrition dialogues and integrate climate biodiversity and nutrition considerations in the fisheries sector. Moreover, adaptation is not something to be um, imposed, I think. It is a process that needs to be uh, co-designed co and co-delivered with local communities who are the custodians of the natural resources and ecosystem. Because when you look into the small scale fisheries sector and the impact of climate change, the small scale fishers whose lives are entirely dependent on fisheries are the ones who are impacted the most. And therefore there shouldn't be any decision done about them without them. So this is very, very important and um, uh, involve their involvement um, um, them as fishers and uh, the fishing communities is essential for the success in any solution that will be developed to address climate change adaptation and mitigation that are relevant to resources and systems upon which um, they, they, they depend. So um, I think that's uh, what I can start with now and I can come in again later. Thank you very much. Really good. Um, Jeremy, what about your perspective? <laughs> well, to be honest, so I feel somewhat slightly embarrassed about talking about climate change, seeing we cause most of it, um, yet people like Edith Rudith's folk are going to bear the brunt of it. Um, so I apologise now. <laughs> um, having said that, I think we, we are seeing very much the impacts of, of climate change um, here, certainly in the UK and Europe. And and it's brought up a, a serious number of particularly challenges from a smaller scale perspective an artisanal perspective obviously you know we don't have the ability to go elsewhere if the fishing in our local area goes down um, if you're a larger scale operator then you, you can just pack up steam away and find new ground somewhere so we are really rather trapped in our local areas, which does in fact encourage lots of local stewardship as an aside. But I mean, for instance, we've got a, a very clear northward migration of cod, which was one of our mainstays on the inshore grounds. We, we see nearly no cod now in the southern half of the UK. And um, they all seem to be moving north because they're chasing the copepod, which is a small plankton creature that, that is moving north because of climate change. So we used to rely very largely in the southwest on mackerel, um, for caught very sustainably with hand lines. Um, very, very few now at the moment, talking to a fisherman down there only yesterday and, and they're not seeing any at all. So that catch has gone down. So it's having significant impacts. Um, obviously invasive species is, is, is making a, a very significant impact on some areas, certainly in the Mediterranean, um, where you've got um, invasive species really decimating a bit like the Caribbean, I think just decimating local, local fisheries. And it reduces the resilience of both fish and fishermen, I think. Um, my biggest concern in terms of climate change is, as I've mentioned earlier, you know, we're seeing this sort of lack of fish on the inshore grounds generally. And then to an extent, I, I suppose you can look at the usual suspects for that overfishing, etc. But I, I am really very worried that if in fact 
climate change and the increase in water temperatures does tend to push fish to deeper, cooler waters. If that's happening in our shallower inshore seas, then we're in, in very serious trouble. So those are really the some of the challenges. I think some of the opportunities, obviously new species is, is clearly, you know, we've had uh, over the last few years, a massive influx of spider crab, um, which has really, in some ways, has been both a problem and an opportunity, but it was a new species and it took time to adapt. And I think there's a lesson here as well that, you know, new species might come in, but you're, you're still going, you still need to identify new methods of catching them, new forms of gear, where does the money come from for that? Uh, and, and certainly new markets in, in terms of storage and supply chains. So there is that particular problem and on, on opportunity. But I suppose my main worry is the resilience. Um, we are in this vicious circle, really, of where we're getting overfishing of many species in many areas, um, which tempts even small scale people to put in more gear uh, because you have to put more gear in. And, and anybody who's dealt with fisheries in, in management or science over the years will know very much you have this vicious circle of as catches go down, fishermen tend to put more gear in, which is more expensive. And the more gear, the more catch, and then the catch goes down again, and you just get round and round in circles for less returns. Um, so I think the key message for climate change impacts really is to have the support, effective fishery management, which we haven't currently got, um, and the support financial as well as um, in other ways from, from governments to be able to provide us with the opportunities to have that level of flexibility that we will need to, to take up the, the benefit from the opportunities and face the challenges. Thank you, Jeremy, really good. And I, I, um, I'll i turn to some questions in the chat at a moment, but it certainly made me kind of react to some of the things that you said, which is certainly if climate change action allows us to get access to new resources for adaptation or for loss and damage, then you know, maybe there are some additional options there. But then equally, I think we can understand the nature of the systemic opportunity here, which is many people have understood that using fish meal in animal supply chains is hugely damaging for many, many reasons. And that the, the big move towards investment in insect meal um, with much lower emissions, for example, may be uh, an opportunity over time to protect some of that um uh the fish meal and reduce the impact and so on so i'm just kind of flagging the systemic nature of the challenges and opportunities here but i think some of the the questions in the chat also kind of refer to some of these elements so what i propose to do um is to call out some of the people who've passed uh have proposed questions in the chat and if you're ready to come on camera and introduce yourself and ask the question i'll do them in blocks of three and then I'll invite Edit Rudith and Jeremy maybe to take note of those questions and then pick up the ones that they might want to respond to. Um, uh, so let me start off and thank you very much, everybody, for what really rich set of questions flowing through. Um, so Virginie, um, how about I turn to you first, if you could um, come on camera and say hi, introduce yourself and ask your question. That would be brilliant. Good Great. to see you. Thanks, Tom, and thank you so much for this event. Um, I was wondering if uh, your panelists had any uh, examples to share of examples in the aquaculture sector where stakeholders of a similar value chain got together to discuss a premium price, um, because we read and hear time again that ultimately access to markets, inputs, and the benefits of development outcomes really depend on the money that uh, small-scale seaweed farmers or fishers make, especially women. So I'm really curious to see if there is any success stories anywhere. Thank you. Brilliant question. Thank you, Virginie. Um, let me turn to Holly Christofferson. Holly, are you there? And come on camera for us. Brilliant. Hi, Holly. Hey there. Um, yes, uh, Holly Christopherson from the US Department of Labor, Bureau of International Labor Affairs. I'm really interested in um, how uh, illegal, unreported and unregulated fishing is affecting artisanal fishers, um, especially in Africa, if someone could speak to that. Brilliant. Excellent. Thank you very much. And um, Julia, maybe I, Julia Nicolini, maybe I could turn to you. Hi. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Um, I'm going to have to read my question out, but it was about the small scale fisheries guidelines um, and maybe getting a perspective from both Edith Rudith and Jeremy 
Edith Ruth, you mentioned the importance of implementing them. So from your perspective, how is that going and, and what are some of the barriers? And for Jeremy, you know, are these guidelines being talked about in the UK as much as they should be? Could they sort of, um, yeah, could they contribute to some of that raising visibility of small scale fishes in the UK? Um, just get to get your thoughts on on the usefulness of that in, in the UK context. Thanks. Edith Rudith, maybe I could turn to you. So we have a, a question on premium prices, one on um, illegal fisheries and one on the application of SSF guidelines. You, you don't need to cover them all, pick whichever one makes most sense for you. All right, thank you. Thank you so much. I'd like to start with the question from Julia. And I, um, I, I thank you all for this very interesting and good question that you've raised. So how is the implementation of SSF guidelines going on, the, the use and application? Um, in my experience, I think the use and application uh, of the SSF guidelines calls for development of the national plans of action for implementing the guidelines. Uh, if you look at the section 13.6 of the SSF guidelines, it calls for the countries, also for the states, to develop a um, national task team, which is multi-sectoral, and brings on board all relevant actors at the national level. So despite it being uh, deliberated at the international level, being an international instrument, but its implementation happens on the ground. And this is where every other policies, whether uh, be it good or bad, their impact are felt by those um, on the ground. So with the development of the national plan of action, which must be a participatory process, then that will guide you know, the, uh, the, the whole process to address the needs of the small scale fishers and all the other actors along the small scale fisheries value chain in terms of transforming in a positive way their lives and livelihoods. And at the end of the day, it will bring us towards realizing the what the SSF guidelines are calling for, which is uh, the food security and poverty alleviation. And uh, um, there are some of the countries such as where I come from in Tanzania, the government has done a lot to facilitate the process. And actually it is among the pioneering countries to develop the national plan of action. However, there are some other countries where even a mention of the SSF guidelines is not there. So why is the situation as it is? What is making it so difficult to be implemented? And that's why, and that's where I'm making this call at this global level that every country should make efforts to ensuring that the SSF guidelines are implemented because there are tools towards addressing a lot of the challenges that we are, uh, we are witnessing today, a lot of um, challenges, and there are so many good sections in the SSF guidelines where if we do make concerted efforts to implementing, then we'll make strides in, in, in improving the lives and livelihoods of the small scale fisheries. Um, the question from Holly, um, I'm not sure if I got it right. Uh, she wanted to understand about the IUU fishing, if it's affecting the small scale fisheries in, 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 in uh, in Africa. in Africa, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that's also a very good question. Actually, yes, it is affecting uh, Africa because in most cases, according to my knowledge, um, in some countries, they don't have the capacities to, uh, I mean, most of the countries in Africa are small scale. They are fishing in small scale. So, like, for example, in Tanzania, 98% of our fishery is small scale. But there are, uh, instances where uh, big ships come to catch fish in the EEZ waters of other countries that are not exploiting their EEZ areas. And this is significant and it is, um, it is affecting 
because at the end of the day, uh, there's, the, the small scale fishers, because they are not able to, um, to reach far where into the deeper waters where uh, they can get more fish, then their lives and livelihoods is impacted because there are some instances where these uh, big, uh, big ships, they come and uh, scoop the fish even in there along near, near the shores where uh, territories for the small scale fishers. So once they do that, they disturb the whole ecosystem and they impact on the biodiversity, the availability of fish. And whenever this SSF, I mean, small scale fishers go out fishing, they'll come out with nothing because uh, the whole system has been disturbed. So this is what I can share because it is really impacting. But also the small scale fishers themselves, despite you know, using um, eco-friendly, but also there are some who use um, illegal fishing gears. And in, in, in small cases, you won't see immediate impact but if you bring them together in terms of number, you will also see that they contribute to the impact of, uh, um, um, you know, over overfishing, for example, but also uh, distracting the ecosystem, uh, the the landing, the the, the fish breeding sites, uh, etc. So both have impacts, although uh, the scale uh, uh, differs from the small scale themselves, but in and, and, and the large scale fishers. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Edith Ruth. And I assume also real challenges in getting enough investment to be able to provide the kind of protection measures against those illegal fishers coming in the inshore for many countries. And it requires a lot of, I suppose, policing and technology and resources to make sure that, that there's the protections in place. But maybe we can touch on that again later. But um, Jeremy, maybe I could turn to you and ask this question about premiums and uh, that Virginie asked and said, you know, what, what are the ways in which we could uh, see access towards sorry, see progress towards premiums for the prices in order to be able to support um, small scale fisheries. What's the experience of that been from your perspective? Well, she <clears throat> means, yeah, thanks, Tom. I mean, I just before I start, I mean, I just want to back up what um, what was just said in, in terms of, you know, I've never ever said that all small is beautiful and all big is bad. Um, what, what's lacking very often is, is, is management and accountability. So let's not just sit on the the fence here and say you know we're okay we're small scale we're low impact we're whatever no we've got to have a, a, a much clearer understanding of the impacts of big and small and to highlight that i was at a conference um one of my very very few exotic conferences some years ago in mexico and there was a as part of it um i think it was organized by too big to ignore great people um and there was a photo competition and some beautiful photographs from around the world uh to do with small scale fisheries fisheries and I recall that about eight out of ten of the photographs at somewhere either in the fore or the background had this massive pile of um, monofilament nets um, that folk were using and we all know the, the issues around those. I mean it, at the same time it's always difficult with these things you always finish it thinking I should have said that or I shouldn't have said that or and other people say well you feel, feel a, a very big uh, response in that but just in terms of time uh, I'm the wrong person to talk about aquaculture really um in in the uk sort of virginia was asking really in terms of that um we've got muscle um uh, very significant muscle aquaculture which was devastated by brexit because it ruined our export trade um the west coast of scotland is infested with corporately owned massive fish farms that are doing all sorts of damage um we've got a a, 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 a seaweed um Growing is now is now, is now growing in the UK, um, and hopefully will be managed effectively. And we've got a sort of good natural oyster thing. So, uh, and they all have their own marketing issues. Um, but I don't pretend to be particularly well, uh, at all an expert um, on that. I would say on the on the Hollis question about we, we do have this issue where we have very very large some of the largest trawlers in the world. Um, operating um, within a few miles of our coasts and scooping up mainly large pelagics and large-scale pelagic species blue whiting mackerel herring etc 
and that they seem to be feeding either, as you were saying earlier, Tom, the sort of the animal feed side, or at least that's then frozen and exported to mainly Africa, I think, um, to feed the populations there. And at the same time, as as uh, as was mentioned, um, you've got these very large vessels from all around the world, if not fishing in an IUU capacity, still operating under some pretty dodgy agreements um, with various countries and where there is effectively no resources for or the resources that they're given up spent on monitoring and enforcement and we're all very well aware very good friend of mine Beatrice who runs the coalition for fair fishing agreements um, from Brussels uh, highlights the issues where you know artisanal fishing and fisheries are being devastated by not necessarily IUU fishing but certainly by fishing that is not being monitored or looked after so it's um it is an issue um i, I don't think we we've still got some iu fishing in, in europe of course we have um it's, it's the nature of the beast to be honest but i don't think it's the scale it is elsewhere in the globe and in terms of julia's question about in terms of you know the guidelines talked about in the uk no they're not <laughs> to be blunt um they are very much down the agenda um for a whole range of reasons um we are, as an organisation, swamped by the day-to-day -day stuff going on to try and um, preserve and support smaller-scale fisheries in the UK. But the the guidelines really haven't um, got a, a very high degree of visibility here at all. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. I'm going to go for one more round of questions with punchy answers, um, and I will okay. take them from the bottom up. So, Momo, if you could come off uh, mute and ask your question, that would be brilliant. Hi, everybody. Thanks very much for the presentations. Um, yeah, I guess I'm just wondering, I, I've worked in small scale fishery projects um, in the past, and I always feel like there's really great results that we can that we can see and share. But I am always stuck about how can we actually um, scale um, good projects, impactful um, results from small scale fisheries. I think both of you have given examples and you, you work for and with organizations that do that, but how can we all do that better in the future to, to share um, good work from small scale fishery projects? Thank you. Thank you, Momo. Let me turn to Urs Baumgartner for your question, please. Yeah, hello, everyone. Well, my question went a little bit, uh, I think it it's similar to, to, to Momo, so basically, I've I've worked on on at different levels within uh, fish value chains and a lot also with markets and what I observe is um, also the the keywords have been mentioned before accessibility uh, or access visibility you know like in in markets usually consumers are not aware where the fish comes from small scale fisheries have no face there and but I think at the same time I mean better visibility is also um, a key to access, no, to better access. So my question is a little bit, despite of all the different opinions that Jeremy, that you mentioned uh, among fishermen, and I also know like the millions of fishermen, of course, we are diverse uh, with the diverse needs, but how would it be possible or is it even imaginable that we could better coordinate and give us or give small scale fishery uh, uh, a unique or uniform voice and face in the market so consumers are aware also of the benefits of small-scale fisheries usually fisheries are mentioned in a negative way because consumers read about industrial fisheries and then destructive um, effects so how to change this how could we coordinate small-scale fishers to really also talk uh, about the benefits Thank you, Urs. And I've got a question from Noah Chongo, but I'm not, I can't see Noah still on. Noah, are you there? I don't think so. Noah's question, I think basically is how do you see the future of artisanal fisheries in the Anthropocene? Which I assume is come, kind of comes with a sense of either optimism or pessimism. I'm not quite <laughs> sure what, but um, uh, um, one to pick up. And then the last one that I will highlight um, Judith Appleton, are you there to come off mute and ask your question? Hi, Judith. Hi, we can we can't hear you. Um, ah, 
we can't hear you, but maybe let me voice your question for you because uh, we're a bit tight on time. But sardine type fish are a key component of local diets of poorer people, but are often hoovered up for fish meal to feed chickens for better off consumers. Who's actually tackling this and how? So I'm going to turn back to Jeremy and Edit Rudith, and we've got a maximum of five minutes for answers here. So anything that you want to pick up, I'm not going to ask you to cover them all, but to pick up and give us some kind of punchy responses would be brilliant. Jeremy, do you want to kick off? Yeah, OK, very briefly. Actually, Ur's question is very good, actually, in terms of, I mean, I'll give you an example in terms of the um, better coordinating um, and the challenges in terms of marketing in the EU some years ago, there was a debate about or a decision to be taken about labelling. And we obviously, small scale local fishers, argued that the label should sow date of capture. And the larger scale people argued they want to be date of landing um, for fairly obvious reasons. Obviously, you know, their fish can be sort of two weeks old before it's even landed. Ours tends to be landed on a daily basis. And we lost an argument. Uh, and if you look at labels, certainly in the UK now, and I think EU, it shows the date of um, date of landing rather than capture. So in terms of better coordination, you've got organisations like my own, um, not for, but in a European context, low impact fishers of Europe life do a wonderful job. I mean, they've got well over 10,000 um, individual fishermen in membership. Um, and it's a very slow process and it's, 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 um, it is an uphill struggle. So it, it's, it's all about, I think, communications and getting people talking together and working together. And that's, a, as, a, as we both recognise, I think, is a, is a struggle. Um, in terms of the future of small scale fishers, I think in the UK, we are in very serious danger of becoming nothing more than a picture postcard fleet. Lack of fish, lack of access to resources, um, climate change impacts. Um, the, perversely, um, second homes is devastating coastal communities. Um, I don't know about anybody else in the world, but here um, we pretty little uh, coastal cottages are going for phenomenal amounts of money and destroying, breaking up um, long term traditional coastal communities and, and, and really throwing a hand grenade into into those sorts of support structures um, for that. So it's we're in a crossroads, really, and I wouldn't like to second guess um what the outcome is going to be all i can hope for is that you know there is a positivity about it and that we do collectively be able to work towards it i'm not um i'm not holding my my breath and in terms of sort of the pelagic species yes it's an absolute nonsense that we're feeding them to what we were until recently devastating the north sea for sand eels to feed the fur factories um yes it's a complete nonsense and uh, we need a root and branch reform but uh, i could go on for a long time but you'll be glad to know tom i won't jeremy thank you very much and um sorry for you to end on such a bleak picture i suppose but um uh, that's where we are um edit rudith i wonder if you can come in and and help us with the kind of last words including i suppose how we can scale effective work on on ssf yeah, if I may go to um, question by Momo, um, there are, yes, great re results, but how to scale them up? Um, I, I think it's uh, by communication. Communication is everything. So if everyone is um, just fenced out and they are doing their own things, they are not sharing, they are not communicating, that won't take us anywhere. And in the implementation, looking at like we have the researchers, we have the academia, we have the states. So sharing, this sharing of information of what is happening and um, not just the good things, but also the challenges so that they are not repeated somewhere else is, is the key. So that those good lessons are amplified and uh, the challenges people learn from them. So communication is, is one particular thing that's very important, building these networks a country to country or even within the country. Uh, for example, um, uh, there is this process in Africa, for example, of building women's networks at the national level. That's number one, very important. Within the same country, uh, members from different water bodies sharing their experiences, sharing these good practices is what inspires others even to do more. And if this also, uh, you know, cross borders to other countries, they also be having some leaves to borrow from this uh, such kind of experiences. So what I underline here is communication. And um, from Bomaga, the <laughs> how 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 can we get more coordinated? 
affected uh, regarding the voice, how to change the narrative, talk about benefits. I think, again, it's, it's in line with the first question, what can be done? So this all, as I, I, I look at them now, I believe so much in community-driven change and being supported by SSF guidelines as a tool once it is implemented and all the principles are followed because SSF guidelines follows the human rights-based approach. And if this, if this is all followed up, bringing all the actors together, uh, the researchers do research that responds to the question that the small scale fishers have, the women fish workers have, and all the other actors in the value chain have, then uh, it will be able to address then the academia like us and all the others. So working in coordination is, is, is key. Uh, sharing this information regarding technology, access to market, all these issues are very, very important. And this will help us to change the narrative in terms of instead of having business as usual, then we'll be able to transform. Whatever you do matters as long as you are doing for the best, best interest of the, of, of the sector. Yeah. Thank you very much, Edit Rudith. Really good words to kind of conclude with. Um, I'm not going to have either time or the talent to be able to effectively summarize the conversation. Um, but if you recall, our original question was, what do we need to do in terms of concrete actions to build on the, um, the year, the 2022 IAFA? And at least for me, I've taken that there's really still some extremely tough challenges and that we need uh, uh, systemic actions, one more coordination, more communication, more resources to where it's needed, more information, understanding rights and access and regulatory regimes and, uh, and uh, work on, on sanctions for where it doesn't go well, but also then acknowledging that climate change is both an added risk factor and an opportunity to look at where there can be some reshaping but that fundamentally we do need to pull together as a community here to work from east to west and from north to south and understand the kind of fundamentally connected issues around this agenda. Um, and, uh, and with that, I think I'd really like to make sure we take the opportunity to thank Jeremy and Edit Rudith for really soldiering through a lot of questions and, and, uh, and uh, um, different perspectives there. Thank you so much. And also thank you to everybody for participating and offering your questions. I thought a really rich discussion. And one final word for uh, the team at IID to Anna and to Christina and to Annabelle, who've hosted this session so, um, so well and, and helped us with such a great discussion. Um, round of applause for everybody involved. Thank you. Um, and the recordings will be made available. Please look out for IID's future work and, uh, and work on our website. Um, thank you very much. Have a great rest of the day, wherever you are. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.